Okay, welcome everybody and thank you for joining us today um, for this Quality Physical Education Schools webinar. We're really excited that you could all join us. My name is Allison Lipset Simpson and I'm the Education Specialist here at Penn State Hershey Pro Wellness Center. Joining me today is David Schmidt. David holds a BS from Indiana University of Pennsylvania and an MS from Slippery Rock University. He has been a physical educator and coach in North Allegheny School District for 23 years. He's held the role of K-12 department chair for 14 years, during which time he has directed a change from traditional to the new PE. He is the Vice President of Physical Education for the Pennsylvania State Association for Health, Physical Education, Recreation, and Dance, otherwise known as PS Aford. He is a past local Allegheny County AFERD president and was the 2005 Secondary Physical Education Teacher of the Year from Pennsylvania State AFERD. David is a 2008 PEP grant winner and Allegheny Intermediate High School is, is recognized as a statewide model program. David has presented at local, state, and national conferences along with hosting numerous school visitations and is a basketball and volleyball official. And so David, thank you so much for being with us today. We are so happy to have you. So this webinar would not be possible without the support from our funders. Funding was provided by the Pennsylvania Department of Health through the State Public Health Actions to Prevent and Control Diabetes heart disease, obesity, and associated risk factors, and promote school health federal grant, and the preventative health and health services block grant from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. We'd like to give a special thanks to our partners at the Pennsylvania Department of Health for their contributions to this webinar. A few housekeeping points um, to get us started. All participant phones and microphones have been muted to ensure that information shared by all presenters can be heard clearly. If you would like to submit a question or a comment for the question and answer session at the end, you can enter that into the question box. We will reserve time at the end of the, que the, end of the webinar to answer any submitted questions. The webinar is being recorded and a link to the recording and handouts will be emailed following the webinar. A link to a certificate of completion and a follow-up survey will also be included in this email. And this email will come out in about within a week of this webinar airing. So a little bit of information about the Pro Wellness Center. Here at the Penn State Hershey Pro Wellness Center, we are committed to educating and inspiring youth and their families to eat well, engage in regular physical activity, and become champions for bringing healthy choices to life. The vision of our center is to reduce the incidence rate of childhood obesity. We aim to be the trusted resource for educational programming, collaborative partnerships, and proven interventions in schools, communities, and like-minded organizations. We pride ourselves on being a great resource for schools and their partners. The PRO in our name stands for Prevention, Research, and Outreach. And examples of our work based on this acronym can be found on our website. Our website also has many resources, including the opportunity to sign up your school or community-based organization to be a healthy champion. Our Healthy Champions program is available for schools and community-based organizations in Pennsylvania. Annual registration is required to receive your welcome kit at the beginning of each school year. Registration begins each spring. There is no limit on how many schools or community-based organizations can enroll, but the welcome kits are limited. Um, all Healthy Champions receive free resources like event planning guides and promotional templates, customized school champion reports, future funding priority, which means you'll find out about new grant opportunities first, and for our local champions, you'll receive special incentives. As a healthy champion, your welcome kit will include posters for our four signature events, which will include Apple Crunch Day, Walk To or At School Day, Go For The Greens, and Move It Outside. So log on to our website for more information about this program. So let's talk about physical education in schools. At the end of this webinar, attendees should be able to understand the purpose of quality physical education for schools recognize key steps to build support for a quality physical education program, and identify key resources related to physical education. So Dave, I am going to turn it over to you. Are you there? I am. Can you hear me? Wonderful. Let me, all right, let's see if you can take it away from here. 
Okay. Well, thank you very much, Allie. Uh, I had a great opportunity to present out of the Penn State Pro, Her Pro Wellness Center last uh, spring. Got to meet Allie and her crew, and they are a very energetic, great group of people, a uh, great resource for you. Um, thanks for having me to do the presentation today. Um, it's something I'm very passionate about, quality physical education in the schools. And I want to start off just sharing with a lot of the credit I get, you know, I get is for the people I work with. Uh, I have a I'm the, I'm the department chair. I have 30 teachers in my school district that I work with. Uh, these particular ones you're looking at right here are in my building at the Intermediate High School. Uh, we teach 9th and 10th graders at NAI in health and physical education and advanced PE where they come every day of the week voluntarily. Uh, so that's I just have a great group of people I work with, and I want to uh, thank them as they always inspire me. And I love the quote up here. I like to try to interject some quotes here and there. If we could give every individual the right amount of nourishment and exercise, not too little and not too much, we would have found the safest way to health. Uh, I wholeheartedly believe in that. Okay, uh, who am I? You already heard that from Allie. One thing I did add in there about the uh, technology award, I was very proud of that. Uh, and I think it ties in a lot of the technology we add with our courses. Um, and I encourage you, if you're interested in technology, asking your principal to put you up for the Keystone Technology Star program. I spent a week in Shippensburg this past summer learning how to integrate technology with my courses, and it was a phenomenal experience. Very intensive, uh, you know, nine, 8 a.m. to 9 at night every night, but we had a great time and learned a ton. Um, first, I wanted to ask you, find a little bit about, more about the audience out there. If you could take a quick moment, we're going to do a quick poll. So I, can, I know who I'm talking to. Are you a high school or middle school teacher, elementary teacher, department leader, administrator, or advocate? Uh, please take a moment and choose one of those. Okay, so we have 48% high school, 27% elementary, 15 administration, and 9 advocate. Okay, looking at that, it's those poll numbers, high school, middle school, you're going to get a lot from this presentation. Elementary, I think you'll also get a lot. There's a lot of ideas that can be used back and forth. I spent my first six years as an elementary teacher, my next four as a middle school teacher, and recently, two years ago, actually, I went and spent a year at the elementary uh, due to a little scheduling snafu, but... Um, so elementary is definitely near and dear to my heart. I think there's a lot of transference available. I think we are all advocates. Um, you know, we all need to be advocates for our programs. Unfortunately, some are on the chopping block out there. We need to be constantly advocating for what we do with our students and everybody else. Um, administrators, that's another role that I have. I spent half a day as an administrator in charge of our health and physical education department budgeting and so on. So I think I have a unique perspective there on how that works. Uh, Okay, let's go back to the presentation, and we'll move on. Okay, that, as you can see there in that slide, that is our 2015 Pennsylvania PE toys and some of our uh, PSA for leadership. I strongly encourage you to get involved in PSA for. Right now, we have a great initiative going on called the Nutrition Habit Challenge. If you go to psaford.org, there's a free entry through the end of it, end of January for a 30-day nutrition challenge and a chance to win a free trip to Disney World. So if you want to check that out, that's a great activity being put out by Pennsylvania AFORD. Um, Allie, I'm having a little trouble here. Well, let me forward the slides. So as soon as we can get this moving, we'll move ahead. I'm going to try this one more time. You should be able to have it now. Okay, thank you. Okay, there's an overview of the topics we'll include, and I think Allie went through that in her preface, so we'll uh, skip that slide and move ahead. The first slide, why is quality physical education so important for students and for our society in general? As a teacher, I think we understand this and we know that it's important, but sometimes we don't always get it through to our students as well as we, sh as well as we should or could. Uh, but I want to take a moment just talking about that question. The first why, this really comes from a colleague of mine who's the department chair for, at Slippery Rock University, Dr. Randy Nichols, has really inspired me recently in some of the work he's done as they look to reinvent and retool their program at Slippery Rock. He did a lot of research and a lot of work with the whole department up at Slippery Rock in figuring out a best, 
a new course of action. And really it came down to some of the major points, and you should definitely listen up for his presentations. Uh, hopefully he'll be presenting at next year's PSA for conference. Uh, he has a very unique and innovative approach that he's come about through the whole story that goes along with it. I'll let him tell you that when he's presenting. But to just narrow it down, talk about why. Why do we do this? Why do we teach that? If we have, help the students understand why, everything becomes more and more clear. Well, the re main reason is to lead kit our students on the path to wellness. That's what we're here for. Yes, we, te we use sports, we use activities, we use fitness as tools, but really we want for our own children, for our students, we want them to lead a long, happy life and have positive wellness. Well, if that's the, the, the goal of what we're trying to do, right now the problem we're facing is why we're so important is we have an epidemic, epidemic of chronic disease. If you look down at the number of deaths for leading causes of death, almost every one of those is a chronic disease that comes about through poor nutrition and lack of exercise. Mainly the nutrition is the number one factor, but lack of exercise also comes in there. Heart disease, cancer, lower respiratory disease, uh, stroke, Alzheimer's, diabetes. The, uh, the more that you research, the more you find out those are things we can directly impact through nutrition and exercise. The Surgeon General recently came out with a report saying to prevent chronic disease and improve quality of life, society needs to eat better, move more, control stress, and sleep better. That's right in our wheelhouse. Those are the things we can help our students to do better through our courses. So we need to look at small ways we can tweak our lessons to incorporate nutrition lessons throughout. To talk about not just calories in and calorie out. They, the, the food industry wants us to think it's all about calories and it's our fault, but it's not that simple. It's the quality of the calories. It's eliminating those empty calories. Uh, moving more, having quality of physical activity, but activities the kids are going to do on their own time and take out of the gym with them. Those things are going to natural. Those two things are going to naturally help us to reduce some of our stress, and those lead to better sleep. Medicine is really not the cure for this. They'll treat it, but prevention is the key. And we have the audience. There's all these initiatives coming out from Let's Move to Action for Healthy Kids, and those are all great initiatives. But they don't have what we have. We have students in front of us every day, and we have an opportunity to make a huge difference in those students' lives. So we need to take advantage of that opportunity. For children and youth, this is the Surgeon General talking here, the number one place prevention can be accomplished is in the schools. We have them and the students in front of us, we can help them to make changes. Why is quality education so important? Well, these are some of my thoughts. In our society, we lead a life where convenience is the top priority instead of health. Everywhere you turn, there's convenience food, there's this, there's that, it's right in front of you. We need to put our students on a path to lifetime wellness. We can do this by teaching the why and the how. I recently had a major change in my life where I just got a doctor's result and my cholesterol was too high. And immediately the doctor said, well, he was a great guy and I really like and respect him. He immediately said, well, we'll put you on Lipitor. Well, you know what? I didn't like that advice. I don't like the idea of having to take a medication. So for the past two weeks of my life with one cheat day, I have gone vegan. And it's been really an eye-opener to me. Uh, I have felt better, had more energy, not been hungry. The hardest part of it, has been planning ahead and planning my meals. And the other night when I had to be somewhere and have time to cook, finding something healthy to eat when I'm out on the road. It really is hard to eat properly without a little bit of planning. So uh, it, it's impacted me, and I think it's, it, I'm seeing what a difference it makes to eat as clean as I have for the past two weeks, and I'm hoping to continue. Um, what I've learned, I've been fortunate enough to travel and visit schools all over the state of Pennsylvania and around the country, really. Uh, through our PEP grants, through our curriculum review process, we re review our curriculum every so many years, and as part of that, we're allowed to go out and visit schools. So I've been uh, to schools from Naperville, Illinois, to Long Island, New York, to Texas, and uh, I've really gotten to see a lot of things, a lot of really cool and innovative programs, a lot of the fancy equipment that you see in action. But the one thing across the board that's really struck me more than anything is that's not what made the difference. It wasn't all the equipment and all the money. It was the leaders. It was the people in those places, the passionate leaders from Phil Lawler at Naperville uh, and Tim McCord up at Titusville to Dr. Nichols at Slippery Rock. The passionate people make the difference, and they're the ones that really drive change. Um, looking down at the, at the cost effects there, this in 2013, there's $2.9 trillion spent on health care. Prevention accounts for 7% of that and treatment for 93 
I think we have the opportunity to really give them a big bang for our buck, especially when you look at the factors, factors affecting health status. Lifestyle is 50% of what affects your health status, your environment, genetics. Everybody likes to blame genetics, but that's a small piece, and genetics haven't changed over the last so many years. Whereas in the last 30 years, we've gone from zero cases of teenage type 2 diabetes to 600 and some thousand cases of, of type 2 diabetes. Our obesity is skyrocketing. We're predicted to have 95% overweight or obese by the year 2050 at our current trend. What's changed? Easy access to bad food and too much convenience. We need to find a way to encourage our kids to, to plan to be physically healthy through the nutrition and their activities. Okay. Um, Love the quote up top, lack of activity destroys the good condition of every human being while movement and methodical exercise save and preserve it. The number one goal as I see it, a couple of them really, but Dr. Graham, our past president of NASPE, says the mission of the new PE is to guide youngsters in the process of becoming physically active for a lifetime. That path to wellness that we talked about. Dr. Nichols on Monday said our job is to help students find their personal path to wellness. Physical, physical education, and I'm sure you've heard this one before, but uh, I want to share it with you again, is the only subject that by its very nature can affect how you feel every day for the rest of your life. I have pictures throughout the slides. These are pictures of students in class or on field trips. We do physical activity field trips. That's us biking in downtown Pittsburgh. That's at a, an adventure race at a local park that we hosted. So just things that we do in class and outside of class for quality physical education to reach our goals. Why is PE important again? Well, these are th things I came up with that I shared our open house with our parents every year. And really, I think, I've, I, think I came up with, it, with these as, after I became department chair about 14 years ago. And these are some guiding objectives that I use when I'm looking at the curriculum that we teach. Number one, people need to understand that health-related fitness impacts our personal quality of life. We all know that star athlete who you know, had everything, was fit, and, you know, and they dominated and now they're sitting on a corner bar stool somewhere. It doesn't go with us. We have to plan to maintain it. Just because we're an athlete doesn't mean we're always going to be an athlete or always be physically fit. Uh, we need to realize that without that health, without that fitness, that our quality of life is going to suffer. We need to realize that our health impacts our whole society. Look at the national debt. Look at the health care crisis and the cost going to health care. Just if we ate healthier and exercised a little bit per day, we could cut that, that, that health care crisis in a huge way. And then we have to realize that our level of fitness has changed, can change, and will change based on our actions. And now is the time to take control of our lives. Really try to get the students to decide, as they become, in our building, young adults, to try to take some ownership and start trying to influence, if they want to do better, maybe influence their parents to buy healthier things rather than uh, a lot of the junk that they w might prefer to eat. Um, Next area is determining the mission of your program. I'm, one of the things I'm proud of is that logo up in the top left. I came up with that my first year as department chair. It's talking about our mission. It, it, it shows our mission in one quick statement. Quality PE should help you to have a higher quality of life. Live strong, live long. I, no, I didn't steal that from Nike. That's uh, something I got actually at American Heart Association conference uh, a long time ago. But the idea that the stronger we try, the stronger we, we strive for, the longer we're going to live and hopefully with a better quality of those years. So <clears throat> that's our, the front of our physical education t-shirt. So constant, kids are constantly getting that message reinforced. Uh, when I did my elementary stint a couple of years ago, I had a principal that made us write our own personal belief statement, a mission statement. And I thought it was a great, a great way to organize my thoughts and share them with my students, with the parents of my students, and with you. I think it's a good exercise for us all to give it a try. Um, my belief statement was, I believe that all people are happier and better able to meet their life goals when they're healthy and strong. I see physical education as a way of facilitating students to maximize their quality of life by empowering them to have the health, fitness, and skills to do what they want when they want. My personal mission statement, I want to work with my students to provide them with successful experiences related to health, exercise, activity, and the love of the outdoors so that they will be intrinsically motivated to pursue an active and healthy lifestyle. I will carefully plan my lessons to maximize the amount of time students are engaged in moderate to vigorous physical activity. I will do this to empower children so they can feel a sense of personal accomplishment as they work with others to accomplish their goals and be responsible for their own futures. I think there's a 
not a lot of words there, but I think a lot of very powerful words about every. If I'm going to plan a lesson, when I teach, talk to my students about why, why is this lesson important? It should meet those mission statements. It should meet, be in line with that belief statement. Our program guiding objectives. Going back to one of my first years as department chair, these are things that I said as we looked at looked at our curriculum and wrote curriculum and talked about what we were going to teach. These are things that I feel are vital to be able to answer these questions in a positive way. All students will be lifelong learners. To facilitate this, I need to address why each curriculum unit is presented and how to extend participation beyond the class. It's great if they do something in class, but if they don't ever take it out on their own, really, really kind of spinning our wheels. So we really want to, and I'll show you that once we get into the curriculum, how we do that. But uh, we want to extend it outside on their own time so that they do it for a lifetime, not just for the 40 minutes in the class that we have them. All curriculum units I present will be lifetime in nature and emphasize, emphasize physical fitness. I try to spend, we try to spend as much time as possible with, you know, we look at the research and see what do people do in their adult lives and try to get them comfortable with doing those things. And then if they don't do those as much, we might not spend as much time. We try to experiment and show them a lot of different things, which leads us into the next one. I will attempt to expose students to many different activities. Every student may not enjoy every activity, but if each student finds a few activities to participate in for a lifetime, I have accomplished my number one goal. So we won't, you know, we do like to give students choice at times, but for the most part, at, at the age that we have the kids, we like to make sure they have experience in all the activities, and maybe for a little while until they build a little bit of confidence. It's easy to say you don't like something when you fail at your first attempt. We try to give them enough opportunities so that they experience some some success and differentiate it in a way they can experience some su success. For instance, I'm teaching the first day of tennis today. There are students there who are really struggling, but they don't have to be professional tennis players. They just have to be able to go out and volley with their husband or wife, uh, boyfriend or girlfriend, their kids, and have and have some fun social interaction while they volley. And they're being active. They're not sitting in front of a TV. Is an example of what I'm trying to talk about. A way to tie it into life without necessarily pre preparing professional athletes. That's a tennis, tennis coach's job. My job is to get them active and well for a lifetime. Uh, viewpoints. I love this attitude of this is what we get to do today versus what we have to do today. They want a class. That's one thing I really try to impart on the kids. They'll come in and say, oh, what do we have to do today? And I, I don't want to hear it. It's what we get to do. And I try to, you know, I might be a little corny in my pitch to them, but I, I envision myself as a salesperson. Uh, they're here every day. They, you know, they want to sit back and they might want to be a little bit lazy. That's human nature. Sometimes we want to conserve energy, but uh, my job is to be enthusiastic and try to get them to see the, the point of view. Is man, I'm lucky to do this. Other people are paying big money to hire a personal trainer and get a workout, and you get this as part of your daily routine. You now we create that attitude. We talk about trying to be better and, and you know, competing sometimes or against people from other schools and working together to build our each other around, around us and create that attitude where we're here to help each other and also push each other. We have to talk about other people's perspectives. In physical education, we don't have to just educate our students, although if we do a great job educating our students and they go home and talk about our classes in a positive way, that does a great job of advocating right there. We also have to talk about our parents, our administrators, other teachers, uh, when you have open house, do you talk about your procedures and rules, or do you sell your program? Uh, we, for the last oh, 10 or 12 years at least, bring the parents into one big group, and we talk about the value of physical education. Uh, a lot of the presentations I talk about are all on my website, including the, the open house presentation. But we talk about what current physical edu education is as opposed to what they may have experienced. And uh, we get a lot of positive feedback from the parents saying, boy, I wish I could go back and do PE all over again with what you folks get to do. And we'll go over that in detail a little later in the presentation. Your administrators can be your biggest supporter uh, and sometimes your biggest headache. But if you're being positive and you're showing positive steps and you're working with your students and they're get, seeing results, that's why you track fitness levels. That's why you track a lot of the feedback from the students. Every unit I ask my kids, what do they think? They rate me on a scale of one to five. They tell me what I could do better. And when they're rating fives and they're giving a lot of positive comments, I can share that data with my administrator to show them that kids are giving positive feedback. They're, they feel like they're getting something out of my class. And then other teachers, too, because we know we shouldn't talk about each other, but we do. And you'll see that sometimes 
the more they say, hey, you're lucky to have that class, that can be a big PR boost too. Um, and then we have some problems too. Who's our biggest problem? Well, right now it's us. A lot of times across the state of Pennsylvania, unfortunately, there's people who are still rolling out the ball who may not be able to justify the why behind what they do. Um, you know, the story I have there is when I, we were in Naperville talking to Phil Lawler, and there were certain people in that group that wanted to question everything he did and say, yes, but, yeah, but, and, I, and as a presenter who goes, has been fortunate enough to travel around the country doing presentations, it never fails. There's somebody that's going to give me a yeah, but. Uh, and it's just, it hurts us as a profession, it hurts that person, there's always a way to get it done if you want to hard enough. I know it's, there's challenging situations, but in your classroom, even without equipment, I've seen great teachers do great things. I have a colleague who teaches in Mesa, Arizona, she has classes of 85 people, mostly non-English speaking, from difficult backgrounds, and the things she accomplishes with those kids are amazing. But her passion is what allows her to do that. And I think people are drawn to passion and, and you have something you have to be really excited about to be able to make that happen. Uh, and that's my quote there leading into that. The quality of a person's life is in direct proportion to their commitment to excellence regardless of their chosen field of endeavor. And I truly feel we have a noble and great calling in teaching physical education and have a chance to make a big difference in people's lives. Uh, to do that, I th really think we need to stretch ourselves. We can't teach from our comfort zone. None of us are probably experts in all the things that we teach, nor should we be or have to be. Our kids aren't. We're asking them to get out of their comfort zone every day for the most part to try new things. And if they are, that's great because 90% of learning occurs in a stretch zone. If I'm teaching basketball and I'm a basketball official, I've been a basketball coach for 20 years, I love the sport. But if I'm teaching basketball, I have kids coming in saying, I love basketball, and they're there and they're showing off and they're well within their comfort zone, or I hate basketball, please don't let me embarrass myself, and that they're in one of those two zones. Very few kids are in the stretch zone where they say, well, I've never played basketball, I really would like to try it, I can see the value and I'm going to move on, not at the high school level. Um, so, But a lot of the activities that we teach, we deliberately put kids in their stretch zone. We try not to put them in their panic zone. We try to take them out of their comfort zone so that that learning does occur. In traditional PE, most students are either in their comfort or panic zone, like I just said. If you expect kids to stretch themselves, you must lead by example. Maybe you're not good at something. Well, that's fine. We have, we have teachers that weren't very much into biking, and we teach biking in our curriculum. I suggest those teachers just level with the kids. Hey, I'm learning this along with you. We're going to work together. We're going to get better at this. I'm excited for this opportunity. Uh, I think I don't think there's anything wrong with that. It shows them that you're going to be a lifelong learner too, right alongside of them. I think one of the things we do is just teach in our wheelhouse when it's okay for kids to see that it's see you struggle and know that it's okay to struggle, you know, and and you can continue to get better and stronger through those struggles. Again, this is what we get to do. There's a part of our ropes course, the, the uh, triangle traverse, and our, one of our fitness centers. We have with uh, we've taken a lot of the weight equipment out and we put in a lot of portable equipment, which we'll get to later. Um, key steps to increase support for PE in your school. Well, what can you do if you don't feel you have that support? Number one, provide a quality program. Your students can and should be your best advocates. How many times are people in your class with you? Is an administrator there watching you? If you're you can you have latitude to do different things. If you're along with standards and you're you're teaching the national standards, you're teaching with best practices, and you try to experiment a little bit, people aren't going to question that as long as you stay in that safety umbrella. And it's it's okay to try new things, but your program is going to speak volumes. When those kids are at lunch talking about things, when we changed our curriculum at NAI, at first we came out and it was a soccer, basketball, football, the traditional curriculum. I just changed my lessons. I started doing some other things. Then another teacher came on and they started doing some of those things. Then we started raising money and we got a few bikes. And before we knew it, kids were asking, well, why don't we get to do those things from some of the sport t sports uh, classes? And then teachers started saying, well, you know what? It is possible. Let's rewrite the curriculum. And then we all bought in. And it, but it, that process took us several years to get to that point. Uh, start with why. Why do you want to do it? Why is it important? If you can't answer that question yourself, you're not going to be able to get that point across to your students, across your administration, across to the parents of your students. 
uh, is a great book by Simon Sinek and a great TED Talk. If you uh, can search TED Talks on YouTube, Simon Sinek is the gentleman's name, talking about Start With Why. I just finished uh, reading that book in, uh, I think I read that in November, December, and it is a phenomenal study of, it's a business book, but there's a lot of correlations of how you can put your customers first. And for us, our customers are the students. We really need to put them first and, and, and make sure they understand why we do everything we do and do it to serve them. Um, give students what they need. That may not always be what they want at the moment. I think sometimes, especially with some of the choice units I've seen as I've traveled around, I think sometimes we say, okay, well, let's do what you want to do. But as we all know, uh, 15, 16 to 18 year olds, middle school students don't always make the best decisions. I love them, but uh, they can make some pretty bad decisions. And sometimes we need to be that loving but tough parent who gives them what they need and tells them the tough truth. Like I tell my students, a good friend tells you what they need to hear, not always what you want to hear. You know, it's easy to just tell somebody what, what they want to hear, but I'm going to tell my kids what they need to hear, and hopefully they grow to appreciate that. And they've told me that in the past that they do. Uh, it's one of the things I do with my students, have them write me a letter at the end of the year, every year, and I tell them I'm the only one that's ever going to read it. Be honest with me. If you think I'm a jerk, tell me so, but just tell me why, please. And uh, it's a great way to grow as a professional. Uh, what can you add? Well, number one, first and foremost, is passion. Share with your students why fitness and activities that you do teach, uh, that you teach, are important in everyday life through examples and stories. Kids like stories. They like you to tie it into everyday life. Um, you don't have to, I do try to be active as much as possible, but I do like to sit down and tell stories once in a while so they can see the whys behind things. Have initiative. Do not listen to those that say no. Uh, change what you have control over your class. One of my uh, principal friends was talking about how, you know, as he sees his staff, there's 15% of the people that are the leaders. They're going to take initiative. They're going to make positive change. 80% of those people will follow them, and then 5% of the people, well, they're just there to collect the paycheck. Uh, whether that's a true ratio or not, I guess it depends where you work and who you work with, but I definitely believe that that 15%, you know, there, there are leaders out there, and if you want to be one of those leaders, lead by example, and people will follow you. Uh, connect. Get involved. Shape America, PSA for Action for Healthy Kids. Um, those have made a huge difference in my life, getting involved with those programs. Get out and talk to people. Uh, the picture's up at the top there. I've been to Washington, D.C. a few times, met with Senator Casey there, Congressman Altmaier, among others. Um, that's Representative Terzai up there on the left. Got to meet with him last spring, uh, Senator Vukulich. And it allows you, gives you a voice. I sp specifically with Senator Vukulich, he asked me questions about, well, my constituents say they don't need PE, they, they play a sport. Well, I got to sit and have a half an hour conversation with him about why that's wrong, why you still need physical education. And he was attentive and listened, but he didn't understand. Hopefully, I helped change his thinking a little bit. Um, but great opportunities to become involved. They give back to you much more than you ever give to them. Local, lo recently passed the ESSA regulations. I believe that's a direct result of Shape America's lobbying on Capitol Hill and teaching our congressmen and our senators about what quality PE is and that it is important. Um, be a role model. Practice what you preach. You don't have to be the best. I don't win many races, but my kids know that I have run half marathons, that I, they know I've biked across Pennsylvania. They know I like to be active with my own children and, get, and go out for bike rides as family social time, I get showing that I value what I'm teaching them. And then partnerships. Businesses, other schools, universities, those go a long way. A lot. If you're close to a university, they want to work with you. They, they want to reach out. That's been a, a big thing for us. Uh, businesses, our biking program. wasn't for our local bike shops. We wouldn't be able to do the biking program we do. They know that they give us the best prices because they know they're going to sell more bikes when we teach biking. They see, they've seen their business skyrocket because we have kids, have 15 and 16-year-olds, 1,200 a year of them on bikes. Uh, other businesses, you see that stack of boxes there. Those are, that's equipment we got for a conference that we hosted last year, and that was donated to us to use for our conference with the people in attendance. And people came from all over the country for that conference. I don't think that's something that everybody's going to be able to do, but you can leverage what you have to help equip your, uh, your program. Grading, uh, I think grading can be one of the things that 
can help you build your program, but oftentimes creates animosity and problems. I like to use grading to lend increased credibility to my program and also as a carrot, but not as so much as a punishment. I know sometimes it has to be and can be, but uh, in our my philosophy, every student has the opportunity to earn 100% regardless of their physical ability. You may, may agree or disagree with that. I know I have colleagues who disagree with that, but we're not like a math class. Our kids don't come to us in differentiated groups by ability level. We have everybody from the high fit to the low fit, athletic to non-athletic, and to penalize them for how they come into us is unfair. I'm going to reward my kids for their effort. I'm going to reward them for coming in and giving me what they have every day. I'm grading on practical life skills and meeting course objectives versus trivia facts and sports skills tests. Looking down below, that's a heart rate system that we have. Uh, actually, we moved on from that one, but if you look at the graph, our students meeting objectives, yes, we're doing a, a spin interval workout. They can see on the board uh, behind my colleague there what's going on and on the computer, I can see what each of them are doing that they're meeting their objectives. You know, and I can start teaching about heart rate training and, and being objective and providing objective feedback to them. Funding, that's always a big issue. First off, I believe that you can do a great program even without funding. You can definitely do a better program with funding, though. Uh, we were fortunate enough to receive a PEP grant, which doesn't exist anymore, but there's a whole new round of funding coming through the ESSA that we're just now beginning to learn about. Uh, fundraiser runs. We host a 5K every year that goes to new and innovative physical education programs. Uh, we've raised probably twenty to twenty-five thousand dollars through that over the ten, last ten years, uh, and plus a lot of good PR for our program because families come and run it together. Clothing sales. We sell physical education T-shirts, sweats, hats, gloves. You know, we 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 share our brand. We we send a message with it. We also make money to pay for the extra things that we do. Uh, we, we scholarship kids that need a T-shirt and can't afford it, but we keep our, our prices low. Our cotton T-shirts, I think we sell for $7, and the other things are more expensive, but they don't have to buy the other things. Um, local grants, Highmark grants, Lowe's grants, going out and looking what's there. This is the, the local Lowe's team and ourselves building a new outdoor fitness course. It took us a day, they, and they provided all the equipment and some uh, free labor. So it was actually a lot of fun that day building that course. Uh, practical hands-on examples of quality physical education programs and ways you can begin to make changes in your program. That's my uh, elementary that I taught at two years ago. We have our um, rail yards. We had them on the ground that day rather than up because it was a younger class. They were just getting started on them. And you see, what do you see? Almost everybody being active. Locomotor skills, but also tied in with a lot of fitness. You know, bear, bear crawling on that uneven rounded surface was tough. Uh, doing wall walks behind. Kids love to be upside down, tuck in their shirt and walk their feet up the wall. And they're doing upper body strength and working on their balance. And they're having a blast with, it, blast with it. It's a simple circuit. We start off, start off every class with, you know, 10 minutes of pretty high intensity physical activity that changed from day to day. But those kids have a great time with those things. Um, why lifetime activities and fitness? Well, team sports are sometimes things that we should do after we develop our foundation of fitness and lifetime activities. They can be a tool we use in our classes, but really we're here to develop that path to wellness. That path to wellness starts with nutrition and physical activity so and physical fitness, so we need to lay that foundation first. Lifetime activities by their very nature are suited for a lifetime, can be participated in alone or with friends, and can be competitive or cooperative in nature. Uh, I was biking to Niagara Falls one time, to Niagara on the Lake actually, from Buffalo, New York, and passed a couple of 70-year-old women who were biking from Rochester, New York, to Toronto to see a play. Tell me those two ladies didn't have a high quality of life. They'd ship their, their good clothes ahead, and they were biking with their tents, sleeping bags, and a small change of clothes over five days. They were biking, for I believe it was five days, from Rochester to Toronto. You know, sharing those kind of stories about, think about your grandparents. Could they do that? How's their quality of life compared to these two ladies who are strong and independent and living the way that they are? On top of that, only 3% of Americans play a team sport regularly beyond age 25. That number is barely a fraction of that by the time people reach 45. So if we're putting all of our time and effort into sports, that's not where our kids are going. They are participating in sports are a great thing and they have lots of value, but primarily they're doing that in another way. Uh, that may or may not lead them on that path to wellness. For some people it does, for other people 
it's something they sit back and reflect on and wish and hope for the glory days to return, but they never do. Uh, how do you start the change? Well, start with your own classes. I is kind of restating what I've already said. Don't be afraid to try new things as long as they're aligned with the recognized standards and best practices. Expand, expand to a small core group. If there's a couple of you in your school that f feel the same way, work together. Use each other as a resource. Over time, other people might buy in. You don't have to be in your face with those other people or be confrontational with, the, confrontational with, the, with those other people because we can be a strong, uh, stubborn character as, our, as physical education teachers. So I think sometimes it's just doing little things first, starting to change a little bits at a time. Tomorrow in your lesson, sit down and talk to your students about why you're doing that lesson, why it's important. Is a one small change you can make right away. Looking at some new activities that have lifetime implications. Uh, practically applied to our school, ninth and 10th grade, we see kids every other day for 40 minutes. This is what we teach. We teach four basic units three times a year, plus fitness assessments. We fitness assess uh, at the beginning and end of the year. We also do formative assessments throughout the year. We teach an adventure unit, a running unit, a biking unit, and a strength unit. We do them in the fall, winter, and spring. You can see uh, as it's color coded there. Adventure team building, biking rails to trails. Actually, and then the adventure team building goes to indoor tennis in the winter. Uh, and then adventure racing in the in the spring, biking rails to trails in the fall, goes to spinning and group fitness in the winter, goes to mountain biking in the spring for those kids that are ready for a, more of a challenge, muscular fitness, CrossFit in the winter, fall, I'm sorry, fall, winter, and spring, but there's a progression there that we go through, running technique and aerobic base building in the fall, uh, winter running and indoor triathlon in the winter time, and we actually do try to get kids outside in the winter and show them it's okay. I mean, we ski, we cross-country ski, we don't have that stuff in our curriculum, but if we can do that, why can't we jog outside? You know, as long, so we try to get them out in the snow and cold weather and realize it's not so bad. It actually feels good. And then trail and interval running in, in the springtime, we get them out in the woods and connect with nature. I think it's important. We're losing touch with nature. I think it's important to get kids out in the woods. And that's our students' favorite things. When they're adventure racing in the woods and they're doing team building in the woods and they're mountain biking in the woods, that's some of their favorite activities. Um, as we move on here, I'm not going to get too much into fitness. We use Fitness Graham. Uh, we do this evaluations. We grade the units. We grade the activities, but never, never on reps or time. We do it based on them meeting objectives, to performing the test correctly for their fitness level, and then setting their own personal goals. Uh, we, I really like to stand with, stick with best practices on that in the way that we do it. Uh, usually, it's never a one-on-one -on -one test. It's usually maybe one student beginning the year observing another one other student working together, critiquing their form and technique. Um, but towards it, as the year goes on, we want them assessing themselves so they can learn how to take it out and do it on their own. Our strength unit, we've gone to almost almost completely CrossFit. Um, why did we do that? How do we do that? Well, it was an evolution, CrossFit, because we have teachers that we have paid to get them CrossFit certified. Uh, you're not, I know you're not allowed to use that term if you haven't gone through and put your teachers through that training. Um, how do we arrive at it? Well, through experience. We started playing around with it on our own on the website and then teachers buying into it and going to our local CrossFit affiliate who happened to be parents in our district and they worked with us and gave us some in-service and training. Uh, we trained ourselves. I mean, we, we have a background in exercise physiology. We have the background to do these things. And then just to be extra safe, we sent teachers to get certified. Uh, level 1 certificates, CrossFit Kids certificates, CrossFit Distance certificates, um, Endurance certificates. Um, but with Traditional selectorized training that we most schools do, one, it's extremely expensive. And our PEP grant, unfortunately, we spent $380,000 on selectorized equipment. That's something now, I'll tell you straight out, was a mistake. Um, we've gone in a lot of our schools, not all of our schools yet, but in a lot of our schools to this because, number one, is selectorized equipment regularly accessible? There's some kids that are never going to go to a gym. They don't enjoy the gym. They still feel self-conscious. That equipment's not regularly accessible. They can't use it on a regular basis basis, whereas a medicine ball, some dumbbells, or a kettlebell, you can slowly build up your own home workout area, and it's not too expensive, and you can make it regularly accessible, even with a, a suspension trainer. I keep one in my car when I go to the park. I can work out. I just have to find a tree or somewhere to tie it off to. Um, is it functional? Do your muscles usually work in isolation, or do they work you know, together in, in a, a whole sense? 
Um, it's not classroom friendly. Can you teach and supervise 30 different stations adequately? Well, we teach a skill, and we all work on one skill in critiquing and, and having the students learn to work together and critique each other um, as, well, as well as us as a group. I can see my whole class doing it and see where the common fault is and stop and reteach that common fault. It's not a ball and a chain to a gym. We can do it anywhere. One machine, $1,500 to $4,000 for selectorized, we can outfit a whole classroom for that with, with types of equipment. And it provides for a maximum number of teachable moments. We uh, produ reproduces real life skills to improve your quality of life, helps produce an educated consumer who understands and can evaluate their new fitness trends and their own abilities. It also encourages students to work together as they support and critique each other. That's a big thing. All in all, it's a lot of bang for your buck. It's just yeah, it's something you have to, you can't teach it the way you see it at the CrossFit competition. You have to differentiate it and scale it back for the level of, that your students are ready for. You really have to take it slow and have an eye towards being cautious. Uh, some, just some pictures of how we do it. This is our top left corner is the Intermediate High School, our new fitness center there at a workshop, at a conference we were hosting. Bottom right is one of our middle schools. We had the rig installed. It's the place of the other equipment. And then a lot of times on a beautiful day, we're outside. We teach it right there on the high jump pit. Uh, we're using body bars, we're using Olympic weights that we've built up over the years. That takes some money, but we've slowly built up that where we have alumilite bars and 10-pound plates so they can get the feel of what it's really like. We have students learning proper techniques on big bars, but they're actually lifting light weights. So it looks very impressive, but uh, and it is, especially the technique, but they're not lifting the heavy weights like we're cautioning against. Uh, biking. Why bike? Well, because Hopefully kids are biking place to place, safety, rules of the roads, uh, to teach them that this might be something they loved as a child, but they never really stuck with. They learned to love it again. Um, a lot of kids, it's amazing how many kids we teach them how to ride a bike for the first time. We talk to them about our city, Pittsburgh, is one of the best bike cities in the country right now. Where to go ride? We have extension assignments. If you look up my PowerPoint online, you can take links to see those maps and show them where to ride. I have uh, other activities there for you. Local trails. North Park is one of the best mountain biking places in the country, and it's in our in our school district. So you can see we go from rails to trails right on our campus. We uh, through a community partnership, business partnership, we had a half mile trail built around the campus. Um, we we go out with picks and shovels and axes, and we clear our own trails around through the woods around our campus. We're lucky to have that. So we've we've made some off road trails, and then on inclement weather days, winter time, we talk about spinning, and we, we teach a lot of heart rate training there, and a lot of fitness activities during the spinning as we have kids close together to us. So it's a lot great opportunity to teach some of those skills. Uh, running aerobic fitness is a huge thing for us. We teach running technique. How often do you learn how to run? Running injuries are one of the most most common reasons people stop exercising. So we actually teach people how to run properly. I personally, we use the pose method and some chi running technique. Uh, if you go to my PowerPoint, there's information in there about that. And it's free, the pose especially is free on YouTube. A lot of chi information is free on YouTube. And you can teach yourself. I've actually gone and taken the clinics and, and workshops and teach your kids how to run properly so it's less effort, it's less soreness and pain. We talk about base building and heart rate training, getting the kids to slow down and run in their aerobic zone instead of trying to run into the threshold all the time. Um, exercising cold weather, indoor training, interval training, trail running, running technology, apps, you know, tracker apps and things they can make, make it competitive and fun. Um, and you say, well, it's supposed to be fun. You're just working out all the time. Well, we try to really build up the idea of the sense of satisfaction versus goofing around kind of fun. We, we try to really take have our students take pride in themselves. Uh, adventure education team building, getting those student personalities. We teach games in adventure education, but, team, but adventure games. Omnikin is one that we use on a rainy day. Other field-based initiatives where it's not traditional games, but non-traditional aerobic style games where they're out chasing each other, like when they, you're playing kick, when, kick the can when you were a kid or release. We have different versions of games that we've come up with that are high, high, a lot of running, high intensity, but the kids are having a, having a blast. It's a great way to start the year and have students get to know each other and work on their problem solving skills. Uh, tennis, I just think it's a great uh, accessibility, lifetime nature. In our community, there's tennis courts everywhere. There's pickleball courts going in. There's paddle tennis courts. So there's a lot of accessibility. It's a great social activity. 
Uh, we do a progression from the elementary through racket skills all the way up to the high school of tennis. We go from racket skills to pickleball to indoor mini tennis at our building to full all-out tennis and badminton at the senior high school. Uh, again, lots of continuing growth and popularity of these activities and the, the lifetime nature of them. Adventure racing, it's a fun way to encourage fitness and training. It's available. A lot of different types of races around that meet the desires of various types of people. Uh, some things that are not school appropriate to things that are, to hardcore athletes, to weekend warriors, and, and more social, socially oriented people. We can make our own adventure. This picture's on the right. We had an in-service day this fall. I took my teachers downtown Pittsburgh, and we had a scavenger hunt. We had to pick, take as many selfies, as many different Pittsburgh landmarks as possible in the course of two and a half hours. We ended up biking 18 miles as a, as a group. That's something you could make up yourself around your campus or for friends. Uh, that's, so we just piloted that with my staff. Geocaching, you know, lots of different ways you can do that on campus, make up your own adventures. Um, using technology, fitness activity apps, Strava, Strava heat maps. I have kids bring in their phones and actually log their workouts on Strava as we're in class. I can go on later and see a map of all my kids, exactly where they're running, as they're running. It's a really cool, unique feature. Um, I'm sorry I'm flying here. I'm looking at the clock and I'm running a little long. Um, Google and Screencastify, extension assignments. If you go to this, this PowerPoint, which I'll post on my website, it's not there yet, it will be there within the next day or two, uh, and click on those links, you it'll take you to sessions I created using the Screencastify app through Google. It's free. It's very, very easy to learn. There's tutorials on YouTube on extending curriculum outside of class, through both running in and biking curriculums. There's examples there. I can't show you now, but if you take the time to go look, you can see some examples there. Class makeups. I have not Kids don't just come in and work out to make up classes. You click on the link, it will show you a list of class makeup activities. They can do them on their own time. They can do a, law, a run around their neighborhood that talks about online safety tips, but they have multiple ways they can extend the class and complete a makeup at the same time. Resources, um, really, they're, they're limitless in today's age. There's so many out there. Some of my favorite ones I've highlighted there. Um, my, the link will take you to all the other presentations that I've done the website where those are list, listed. So if you do want to look up some of the, there's one on just biking curriculum, one on just running curriculum, and those are a little bit out of date now, but they have the basics. I've always modified and changed them from year to year. So those are a couple years old, but there's still a lot of, I believe, a lot of good things there. Um, if you have questions, feel free to contact me. My email is right there. It's in the PowerPoint. I think Ali shared it with you also. And amazingly enough, I got done pretty much on time. So you know, we have a few minutes. If you have questions, uh, feel free to ask away. I'll answer what I can. Thank you so much, Dave. That was awesome information. And we did have a couple of questions come in while you were speaking um, that we'll get to. But I want to remind everyone that um, if you do have questions, you can put them into the, um, the chat log box and send them our, our way. And um, we'll have Dave answer them. Um, so one of the questions that came through was asking about um, raising funds. And I know you touched a little bit on, on that in the presentation um, with grants and things like that. And you talked about Lowe's and Highmark. Um, so if you would take a minute or so and um, maybe expand upon where, where you go to look for some of your grants and how you raise some of the funds to do these things that you're doing. Okay. Um, well, the, the one thing actually, I'm glad you asked that question, because the one thing I overlooked to mention was and I know this might take a little while, but I think it's important to realize everywhere we've put these new ideas in curriculum-wise, one of the things that's happened that's been a unique at outcome of this, our budget always goes up within the building. So we might go, you know, when I've gotten to a building or started teaching in a building, the budget was really low. When the, when the principals see results, they tend to raise your budget. They have a, a definite limit on what they can what they have to give, but they can redistribute a lot of times, and I've seen our budgets go up year from year to year because our principals and our administrators are buying in. So I think that's one way is just improving your program goes a long way. Um, the other ways, I'm a big believer in the uniforms, uh, not to embarrass kids. We, we make ours popular. It's actually become kind of like, you know, you wear your Nike stuff, you wear your Under Armour stuff, you wear your Phys Ed stuff. We have slogans, it's popular. We try to put new artwork on it every year, and we, we make a uh, pretty significant amount of money off of our t-shirts, sweatsuit sales. Um, and then also we have, you know, we have the cheaper versions, we have more expensive versions, but we are fortunate to 
be in a disc where we are, but even if we sold the cheap t-shirts, we can make quite a bit of money off of that, and we're up front with the people. This money goes direct, is, there's profit built in, and it goes directly back to the program, and they know that the mountain bikes were all paid for with uniform money, that the extra things that we do, the new sound system, the new stereo they get to listen to during class was paid for with the uniform money. Um, I think uh, before school activity programs, we, we've had PFAs that will run a before school running program, and the, whatever they pay, part of that might go to a teacher, part of that might go back right back to the physical education program. And that's a lot of times, you know, you may volunteer your time, but the profits from that running program come back to you in the form of equipment from your PFA. We've had a PFA donate money and as our parent, parent uh, group for our district, and they've also taken those profits that they get and given it right back to us. And then, of course, grants. There's so many grants out there today. Uh, look through the password website, through Private State Pro Wellness, there's a lot out there that, that you can look for. Local stores, also McDonald's, Walmart, um, Lowe's are all great opportunities. Awesome. Yeah, it's, um, that's great. And we do, like you said, we put um, grant information on, on our website, too. So it's another great place to look um, for information. Um, one of the other questions that came through is, how long are your periods? Um, at the middle school through high school level, we have 40 minutes, 40 to 45 minutes, 45 at the middle school, 40 at the high school every other day. And we see our kids every other day, all year long, for the most part. Uh, we do have an elective course, which is every day, all year. And at the elementary level, we see our kids once a week. Great. Um, another question that came in is, is getting more PE in schools more of a state or district issue? Um, how do we get uh, Pennsylvania to require um, more in our schools? Um, a couple of things. Number one, the new uh, ESSA guidelines have come out from the federal government list physical education as a core subject. Now, they, they changed the terminology around, and the, the term they're using is escaping right now, but we're listed right up there with math and English and other curriculum areas, but there's no mandates for time with that. At the state level, there's the standards, but also, again, no mandates for times, and they're very, they don't and come out and force them unless somebody complains. There are districts, unfortunately, in our state that are cutting PE and making it an online option. Um, I don't see that changing, but that's part of what we're doing, why we go to the state capitol to advocate for that exact thing that they uh, mandate for those changes. There's not a lot of support for that right now. I think our best way, the absolute best thing we can do is advocate. When we talk about cutting PE in our district, there's a lot of people that speak up and say, you can't do that. Um, I'm sure that's happened in other places, but unfortunately we have several neighboring districts that have cut a significant part of their PE. I think we need, our best line of defense is what we do in the classroom. So Great. And we are almost at time. Um, maybe if you could answer one more question uh, for sure. us, that would be great. Um, so question is, what if I don't have administrator support or I'm tied to a curriculum? What's your thoughts on that? Uh, it's a, that's a very common question. And that's where I go back to, how many times is somebody watching you teach? And, and I, this is just my opinion. This is, you, you, but are they in the gym watching you teach? And are you doing some wild, crazy thing that's unsafe? No. Are you doing something that's within best practices? That's part of our national standards? Uh, are you, you know, pushing the envelope a little bit? But you're along those lines. I say go. For, I mean, it's this is my opinion, obviously, but you have to take those kinds of risks as a teacher. That's why uh, teacher tenure was created to protect you when you're taking good educational risks. And I think sometimes you, we need to push the envelope as professionals and say, you know, this this isn't the best. I want to try to do what's best for my kids and, and level with them. Hey, we're going to change it up a little bit today. I think you could use this. I think this is really be a really great activity for you. This is why it's a great activity for you. We're going to try this today. Just see how it goes. And if somebody comes comes in and says, slaps you on the wrist, well, then, you know, you have to take that sometimes. That's, again, that's not me speaking professionally. That's me speaking personally, though. That is wonderful. Okay, so Dave, thank you so much for um, for all of 
your input today. This was fantastic. Um, and thank you to everyone who joined us on the webinar. There's some information up on this last slide about staying connected to Pro Wellness. So um, different ways you can connect with us after this webinar is over. We will, um, as we mentioned earlier, post um, this archive. We will archive this webinar and post it on our website um, within a week of, the, um, of today. And um, we will also be sending out an email following this webinar um, as soon as the webinar is posted online. And that will include the link to the archive webinar. It will include a PDF of all of these slides. It will also have a survey um, that we would love for you to take. Um, and take a few minutes to fill that out for us so um, we can get your feedback on today. And um, again, we just thank you very much for being with us. And Dave, thank you. Hey, thank you. I appreciate the feedback you give on the survey. I would appreciate that. And I will also post that PowerPoint to my uh, website, which is northallegheny.org, and go to the physical education part of it. Department Wonderful, and, and we will make sure that that makes it on our website as well so that um, in the event that they didn't grab it from this now, um, they can get it from our website, so they'll be able to get you that way. All right, thank you. Great, thank you, and thank you to everyone.